Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we're going to be talking about what do we do with Genesis 3. Now, Genesis 3 has a lot of features that uh, cause a lot of debate, a lot of discussion among Christians. What is going on here? There's there's a lot of details that, that at the face value don't make too much sense. Just look at even verse 1, Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? We are introduced right off the bat to a talking serpent. A talking serpent, right? And Christians, they'll say, oh no, this is not a serpent. This is actually Satan, right? It's Satan. Well, is there anything in the text that suggests so? Uh, th- this is this is not a position that's that's a bad position to day- take. There's There's people very learned people who take this position. Michael Heiser will play a couple clips from Michael Heiser and what he says about this passage. He identifies this serpent as Satan. We clearly are not dealing with a member of the animal kingdom. It's some sort of divine being. So the word for that being, that figure in the garden is Nakash. What I think is going on here is a triple entendre. Nakash, as far as the root of the term, the three consonants, nun, chet, and shin in the Hebrew word, these three consonants are the root of a noun, a verb, and an adjective in Hebrew. If we take nakash as the noun, pointing to the noun, that would be the word for serpent. And of course, this is how all the translations go. It's perfectly understandable. There's nothing wrong with it. M- what my view says is what's wrong with it is assuming it's a member of the animal kingdom. So, nachash could be serpent as a noun. Verbally, the verb means to deceive or practice divination or deception through divination. So, Nakash here could speak of or describe or imply a deceiver or again some sort of uh, being that had divine knowledge and of course in the story uses that knowledge uh, to manipulate uh, humanity. Well again this certainly fits the story. Now these two options many commentators will notice but somehow They still want to gravitate toward a member of the animal kingdom. I don't understand the thinking behind that, but at least they notice these two items. The third gets neglected. If you're thinking of how this this root is used adjectivally or an alternative noun, uh, it means bronzish or bronze, brazen, shining, okay, is the point. Brass shines. That's why it's attractive. So if you take nakash, and specifically the, the Hebrew text has hanakash here, it has the definite article, the term would mean the shining one. And I think that needs to be factored into the discussion of nakash in Genesis 3 because shining or luminosity is a quality that is frequently applied to divine beings in the Hebrew Bible and lots of other places in the ancient Near East. So this is why I say we have a triple entendre going on. We have some sort of being either manifesting as a serpent or a serpentine uh, creature, but it's not a creature, it's not a member of the animal kingdom, it's a divine being who is luminous, shining, and has special divine knowledge and deceives humanity. Now you could take the Michael Heiser position. The Michael Heiser position is a defensible position. It's a rational person can take that position. Michael Heiser takes that position. Or Michael Heiser is a rational person. But it seems to me that sometimes Michael Heiser, what he does is he argues for wish fulfillment. He wants something to be a certain way. So he finds reasons to argue that it is that way. And rather than letting the text uh, reign supreme. So I'm going to show you a different theologian of a different theological bent, and we'll see what he says about this text in Genesis. We made them, put them in the garden of Eden with the animals, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay, brilliant. He's done well there. Um, now, 
chapter three, and I, I'm not... <sighs> I'm not having a go at him, because he is brilliant, but in my humble opinion, I think the snake was a mistake. <laughs> and I... OK, chapter three. His difficult third series. <laughs> it's going to get criticised, whatever, isn't it? <laughs> After all the good he did in one and two. He should just leave it there. <laughs> Chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, It's a talking snake, did I not? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. What, you don't believe he can make a talking snake? You having a laugh? <laughs> of course he can, do anything. Now, I used to hold the Michael Heiser position. I used to hold the position that uh, the creature being talked about in Genesis 3 is... Uh, angelic creature or it's a satan type of creature and that's who's being presented so much so that a lot of times when i'm still talking about uh, this situation here i might sometimes say satan oh satan said this or something like that and in job too it's like oh uh satan said whatever well it's the satan and here it's oh, the serpent so sometimes i need to catch myself because it's been so thoroughly ingrained to me that that's what's going on here Sometimes I will slip up. But Ricky Gervais, he makes a compelling case. So I, I heard him, him, his theological rant, and then I turned down to Genesis 3 to see if what he was saying is accurate. Because, you know, that's that's surprising. And you, you, got, you got to always look at what your critics say to see if what your critics say are true. So what indicators here would we have that this might not be a divine creature? Well, number one, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. The serpent's being numbered with the beast of the field as crafty, particularly crafty. And that's why it's talking. It's a talking animal. It's more crafty than any other beast of the field. Now let's scroll down and see if we can't find any more indicators of uh, what this creature is. So this, the serpent, of course, uh, tricks uh, Eve into eating this fruit and and there, there's negative ramifications, and, and God comes down, and he's talking to them, and he starts giving, handing out curses based on what people did. And what is the curse against this serpent? Is it a curse against a divine creature, like, oh, Satan, now you're expelled from heaven, or something like that? Or is it more fitting of an animal? What is going on here? Let's read this curse. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock, and above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And so the curse against the snake is to uh, crawl around on its belly. So before this point, this snake had maybe like arms or was upright or, or something, but wasn't crawling around on its belly in the dust. And so eat dust all the days of your life. That seems to me to be... Uh, a figurative uh, statement for your, your face is going to be pushed into the dirt and you're going to be swir swithering around. You're not going to be ingesting dirt to live. I don't think that's what's going on there. It's not like uh, worms eating dirt or something like that. But I, th I think it's just, you're just going to be down in the dirt. You're going to be dirty and uh, that's, that's how you're going to have to live your life. I will be put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So not only does this serpent creature now have to crawl in the dust, but also the serpent's going to have children and the children's going to fight with the offspring of man. That sounds to me like historically the, the antagony between snakes and human beings. Do you like finding a snake? Do you like seeing a viper? Uh, I was watching this uh, show with uh, what they call noodling where where all these people in the south, what they'll do is they'll stick their hands into these holes in these waterways and then uh, the catfish will grab onto their arm and they'll pull it out. But in the show, you have water moccasins just swimming around. I wouldn't want to be in this water with these water moccasins. Water moccasins are dangerous. And so snakes were vile creatures. Snakes were dangerous. Snakes will kill people. Elseth, in his book, Did God Know? He starts it with a story about a young girl who's accidentally killed by a snake. These, these are deadly creatures. 
there is a lot of antagony between snakes and human beings. And this seems to be seems to be operating as a mythical basis for this antagony. It doesn't seem to be some sort of divine statement. A lot of Christians try to make this into a divine statement. They say that, oh, because seed is singular, that means that this seed must be Jesus. And uh, Jesus beating the seed of the serpent means Jesus destroyed the forces of darkness. I don't see that in the text. I, I just I just don't see that there. I don't see any references to that anywhere in the Bible. I just I just don't see it in the text. And even John Calvin in his commentary on this text, he points out that it, it you're probably making too much trying to make this apply to Jesus. It is a collective noun, and of course it's going to be singular for for that sake. We'll read that later when we get back to this portion. But notice that there's there's nothing in here that really gives us a true indication that this is anything other than an animal. And and uh, there there was an interesting theory thrown out when I went to John Day's talk on Genesis 3 at uh, Society for Biblical Literature. One guy brought up the fact that in Genesis 2, there's this whole selection process for helpers. And guess who is skipped up as a, as a helper for Adam? Oh, this clever serpent is. So maybe, perhaps... Perhaps reading in context, there there might be, I'm not saying I believe this, there might be some revenge element as motivation for the serpent. Adam doesn't pick this serpent. The serpent's mad and tries to sabotage women and men. That it could be. That might be what's going on there. I'm not saying I believe that. But what we have here is we have a serpent. The serpent is crafty, clever. The serpent talks. The serpent has legs. And that's another thing that uh, if you skin a snake, I'll try to pull up a picture here real quick. Pulling up a picture of snake skeletons, you see that snakes have spurs. And these spurs, a lot of people speculate, could have at one time been full legs. And if I was a skeptic, I would say, well, what happened in the ancient Near East is is that they had killed snakes and they found that the snakes had these things. And then they also speculated that these snakes once had legs and they so they wrote it into the mythology. So, you know, a lot of times like mythology could work one way or the other. The skeptic could say, well, it, it was just written in there because that's things they found. And uh, the true believer could say, no, that, that's, the, that's the why these things are the way they are, because look at this story. And uh, as evidence, look at uh, this, this uh, physical evidence that we have. You know, either way it works. Rational people can disagree. But, but so there is there's some indication that we're talking about actual snakes and not a divine being. The punishment does not fit a divine being. Uh, there's nothing that says it is a divine being. It's being numbered among the beasts of the fields. And uh, it explains a lot of uh, this antagony between man and snakes. That's that's a historical historical antagony. The, these, these serpents are not good creatures. So I do believe we're talking about an actual snake in Genesis 3. I think the text indicates that, the context indicates that, and there's nothing really in the Bible that doesn't. There might be one reference in Revelation to this snake being perhaps uh, the Satan creature. Let, let's turn there real quick. All right, we are now at Revelation 12.9, and it says this, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So the Satan is uh, identified with both being a serpent, a dragon, and a deceiver of the world. It doesn't give a time frame on this deceiving of the world. So did the deceiving of the world happen back in Genesis 3? Or did it happen uh, presently or previous at some point? It didn't, didn't really talk about it being an ancient deceiver necessarily. But you get the the name ancient serpent. So is this a reference to Genesis 3? It very well could be. But it could also be as opposed to a reference to Genesis 3 yeah, or and or. You always use the and or. Or it could be a reference to Isaiah. Let's read Isaiah 21. In the day that the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. So you got a serpent called Leviathan, 
the Leviathan, the Twisting Serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. So is this serpent have in Genesis 27? Is that the same thing as the dragon? Kind of kind of reads so to me that the serpent is the dragon, and God's going to destroy this serpent and dragon. And Leviathan and serpent are chaos imagery that are that are often associated with like unformed earth. So it would be this ancient idea, ancient warfare of of chaos beasts that God would tame. So it seems to me that Revelation is more of a reference to Isaiah 21 and not so much a reference to Genesis 3. I don't know if the Genesis 3 one would even work because uh, you, you got uh, like fighting imagery. You got you got fierce imagery going on in Revelation that might not match the tone of Genesis 3, what's going on there. Now we're pretty far into this podcast and we're still on verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So he's asking questions that, that seems pretty harmless. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now some people say that she's adding this last part, You shall not touch it, lest you die. But we don't know. The, the text doesn't indicate, well, I'm just going to take her at her word, that that is part of the curse that God had said. That the day you touch it, you touch it, you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. And you will, you will not surely die is the ESV. You will sure not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So the serpent's spinning this situation. So it's not necessarily like an outright lie. It, it's a deception. He's, he's, he's trying to trick her. He's saying that uh, this is not a poisonous fruit, so don't think this is a poisonous fruit. This is a fruit that enables a moral vision. You, you'll eat it, and you'll be able to understand things that God understands. And God knows about this, and so God doesn't want this. God doesn't want you to have this power. And no, and no, it's that's true. That's true. There, there's truth in what he's saying. But uh, he's using the truth in such a way to get her to perform an action that will have adverse consequences against her. And that way you could call it, you can still call it a deception, even though he's telling the truth. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was, was to be desired to make one wise, she took his fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So his, her husband's with her. So what's he doing? Is he standing next to her this whole time? Is he listening to this conversation without stepping in? Is, is it just, does it just mean that she wouldn't kind of found him because he was in the general area he was with her? So it, it's uh, ambiguous what's happening right there. Then the eyes of both were open. And this is the, the, what the snake said was true. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And a man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. So this part's really interesting. So you have God and God has a body. This is Yahweh God. The Lord, when Lord is used with uppercase, that's the, the word Yahweh. And he's walking in the cool of the day. So the imagery that we are are getting is that he's having a leisurely stroll something that he's probably enjoying is probably what we're supposed to take out of that and the man and the wife they don't believe that he has omniscience about everything that's going on in the garden and so they're under the impression that uh, they could hide from them so they hide from the presence of the lord god among the trees in the garden the presence of the lord is an interesting phrase that we find throughout the bible when uh People are cast away from God. They're cast out of the presence of, of God. Cain, when he's cast out, he kills Abel. He's cast out of the presence of God. You're, you're being thrust out of where God is. And so d does God have a presence? Does God have a land? God's often associated with land throughout the Bible. Michael Heiser has a lot of good stuff about uh, God and land and presence that uh, we probably can't get into now, but it's, it's worth looking up and looking into the presence of the Lord, what that means. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, where are you? Now, a lot of people make much ado about this little phrase. So 
I was talking to Matt Slick the other day, Matt Slick, uh, terrible human being. And, uh, you know, he likes talking to himself. He doesn't like talking to people. So he doesn't care what you believe. He doesn't care about your positions. He just has his talking points. And so he has a conversation with himself. So what he's doing is he's trying to tell me that uh, Genesis 18 uh, doesn't mean what it says. Why? Because he doesn't want Genesis 3 to mean what it says either. And so what does Matt Slick think is going on here? And this, this is pretty common to Calvinists. I was talking to, I think it was Ronald Nash, Ronald Nash, back when he was alive. And uh, I was in Summit Ministries and I sat down with him at lunch one day. Might have been Ronald Nash. Might have been a different guy. But he's he said, "Oh, open theism. Well, open theists don't aren't very consistent because they say God doesn't know stuff, and they say that they learn that from reading the straight value, uh, straightforward reading of the text. But turn to Genesis three. Uh, God doesn't know what's going on there. But what actually is happening is it's a known answer question. He's trying to get them to confess." It's like, I've, I'm have i sitting there, I was like, I don't know, like 18 or 16 or something like that. I'm like, I've never heard an open theist in my life claim that Genesis 3 has God not knowing where Adam and Eve are. I've never heard it in my life. And so people like, like Ron Nash, they'll just make things up out of nowhere. Absolute nonsense that they make up out of nowhere. Who, who, who believes it? Who, who's ever said that the text in Genesis 3, Genesis 3 indicates that God doesn't know where Adam and Eve are? It's a known answer question, as Ronald Nash pointed out. But, but what, what these guys try to do is they, they don't want to talk about actual texts, and they want to build straw men. So the best way to do that is to turn to Genesis 3 and pretend that the straightforward reading of Genesis 3 is God not knowing where Adam and Eve are, and he's like searching for them, maybe, uh, which, yeah, yes, could be the case. It could be the case that in Genesis 3, God does not know where Adam and Eve are. And it could be the case that he is searching. It could be the case that when he says, where are you? He's actually legitimately inquiring what's their current location because he does not know. That is a possible reading. But that's not the only reading that makes sense with normal reading comprehension strategies. So where are you? It could be, as Ron Nash pointed out in his straw man he's building of Open Theist, it could be a known answer question. It could be him trying to figure out if Adam and Eve are going to confess. Notice that part. A known answer question has a purpose. And the purpose is to gather new information that you don't have otherwise. God doesn't know if they're going to confess or not. And so he throws the question out, like if I, I walk into my boy's room and they're supposed to be cleaning, and I say, have you been cleaning? And I could look around, and I see it's not true. But, but the purpose is to see if they're going to confess and see if they're going to you know, tell me the truth. Because I, I have the answer already. I just need to figure out if their answer is going to match up to what the actual answer is. It's a known answer question. It, the purpose is to gain information, to learn new things. Ah, oh, so even... Even the Calvinists in their straw men, they, they build more problems into their system that they just overlook because they're, they're, they're not thinking rationally. They just, they just want to beat that straw man to death, beat that, that uh, dead horse to death, uh, and uh, just pretend like they won some sort of argument. <laughs> oh, Matt Slick, he was incredibly delusional because my literal argument was in Genesis 18 when God is going down to see if the reports which came to him are true, that that text does not have God knowing present knowledge. And so Matt Slick turning to a text and claiming that this text also doesn't have him having present knowledge, that doesn't defeat my argument. Matt Slick is talking to himself. He doesn't know how to talk outside his talking points, and he doesn't know how to interact with actual points that other people make. He's delusional. He's a delusional person. I did find one open theist who does claim that this is legitimately God not knowing where people are. Just one. But he wasn't a main name in open theism. He was just one guy. And you know what? That is a legitimate reading of this text. There's there's nothing in the context that suggests otherwise, rather than what people want to import onto the text. So that is a rational position to take about this text. And it shouldn't be looked down on. It shouldn't be automatically dismissed because we don't like, uh, you know, the implications of what that's going to be. We, we need to care about the text. The text needs to 
take primary focus. We need to look at the possibilities and probabilities of what's going on. And we can't do that thing where the wish fulfillment that we already talked about. We can't say, oh, this is what I want the text to be about. Therefore, I'm going to say that that's the explanation of this text and just discount any other readings that could fit what's going on here. Rational people try to look at what's possible and then try to rank it by probabilities. And they just don't discount other possible rational readings of the text. So it could be. It could be that God doesn't know where they are. He's inquiring for actual information. It could be a known answer question. That's another possibility. He's just uh, trying to see if they're going to fess up to something that he already knows. And so there, it's, not, it's not required It's not required to read this as a nescient text. And so when Calvinists turn here for a proof text on why we should ignore other parts of the Bible, um, they're building strawmen. They're, they're being fake. They're being disingenuous. They're not thinking about their arguments. They're being uh, bad theologians, bad readers, bad readers, which is even worse, even worse than a bad theologian is someone who can't read, who doesn't understand uh, reading comprehension. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's worse. That's worse than a bad theologian to me. All right. So we're back here. But the Lord God called to man and asked him, where are you? And he said, so this is Adam now speaking, I heard the sound of you in the garden, sound because God has a body in this text, he's walking around in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? It could be, of course, a known answer question, could be a legitimate inquiry, two possible readings. There's probably others that we haven't explored here. But each reading you have to explore on its own merits. And just discounting the text because you don't like the implications, that's an argument from implication. That's a logical fallacy. That's the moralistic fallacy. It's a bad fallacy. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not a rational position to take. I like this. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. He's, he's passing the blame to God. He's like, God, this is your fault. You gave me this troublemaker and look at what she did. So you're the fault here, God. You're, you are at fault for this whole situation because you gave me this woman. This is not my responsibility. This is your responsibility, Lord. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? I, I like the way that God is handling this. He's asking questions. He's figuring out stuff. He's, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, he's inquiring. And, and we, we see later that according to each one's answers, they're given a very comparable punishment that uh, that fits what they answer. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock, above all the beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. It doesn't allow the serpent to respond and defend himself. I will be able to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Let's read John Calvin on this. Is this referring to Jesus? Now remember, John Calvin... Very good with language, very good at interpretation, very good with reading comprehension. I like John Calvin. I I don't like him as a human being. I don't like him as a human being, but he says a lot of good stuff in his commentaries. His commentaries are always worth reading. He seems to be a rational person when it comes to certain aspects, certain aspects. Here's what he says about this, this passage here. There is indeed... No ambiguity in the words here, here used by Moses. Uh, the Bible doesn't claim that Moses wrote Genesis, by the way, but yeah, we'll go with it. But I do not agree with others respecting their meaning. For other interpreters take the seed for Christ without controversy, as if it were said that someone would arise from the seed of the woman who should wound the serpent's head. Gladly I would give my suffrage in support of their opinion, but that I regard the word seed as too violently distorted by them, for who will concede that a collective noun is to be understood of only man, one man only? You know, some t- sometimes seed in the Bible is used for one person, but uh, his point still stands. Further, as the perpetuity of the contest is noted, so victory is promised to the human race through the continual succession of ages. I explain, therefore, the seed to mean that the posterity of the woman generally. This is this is John Calvin arguing that this this phrase is not a prophecy of Jesus, which is the position that I take. 
rational people can disagree. Uh, you can have your arguments, but it just doesn't read to me that this. <laughs> I, I, back to the summit ministries, real quick. I was talking to the one kid, and and he thought this is this this was proof positive that uh, Adam and Eve believed the gospel and were saved by faith alone through the gospel because they were given this prophecy and all they had to do was believe on this to be saved. And his position was that uh, throughout the Bible, at all points of history, all you needed was faith and not works to be saved. And, and this was the proof that Adam and Eve had been exposed to the gospel, that the gospel existed eternally for everyone to listen to and believe in. And that just doesn't seem to me. That doesn't seem to be what's going on here. I, there, and there's no indication that this is a gospel. It, to be a gospel, it, it's pretty cryptic. It's pretty cryptic, and people have to read a lot into it. It's it's not on the face face value. Very explicit. What's going on here? And so, if this is your method of salvation, you got some problems, my my buddy, my friend. So God next turns to the woman. He says, "I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you." So he's God is playing off this. Uh, conflict between man and woman and he's he's subjugating woman because woman was taking the leading role in this situation now man is put in the leading role and woman is now subservient so it's almost like the punishments fitting the crime and he says to adam because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which i commanded you you shall not eat of it Cursed is the ground because of you in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life now, Adam, he, he doesn't get to live in luxury anymore. He has to work for what he gets. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By your sweat of your face shall you shall eat the bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So Adam leisurely accepted this free food. Now he has to work for food. He does. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And notice what goes on next. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So this is the first major death in the Bible. This is the first, like, maybe there's uh, microbes and bacteria and stuff that are dying, like, in your stomach all the time. But this is the first major death, and it happens as the result of sin. And this is a sacrifice in order to cover someone's sin. So this could be the origin of of uh, sacrifice as as a requirement to cover sin it could be equivalent to these garments that are covering adam and eve's sins it could be equivalent of these animals dying in order to make these skins i mean they already had clothes of of leaves and stuff like that i'm sure god could have built them like velvet jumpsuits but no uh, animals dying was the consequence of their sin so one thing we notice about these punishments is that Adam and Eve are not killed. They do not die. And uh, that's interesting because it says throughout the text here that God tells them they will die. In Genesis 2, it says the same thing. Genesis 2.17, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Surely die is a double enforcement of dying it's dying you shall die this is the words used by abimelech when he thinks god's going to kill him he's like you know you're going to kill me dying i shall die it's the the hebrew language uses this doubling concept to, to mean ultimate so there there's literal physical death being threatened here some people think that it's just a spiritual death and it's just a spiritual separation from god and that's that's what the death is where do you get that from the text? Where in the text indicates that this is a spiritual death rather than a physical death? It seems to me that this this whole chapter of Genesis, this, this whole passage in Genesis, there's no idea of a spiritual death. There's, there's no idea about spiritual life and death uh, throughout Genesis. It's just not a concept that's being introduced. It could be introduced later by other writers and other contexts, but in the context of Genesis, we're talking about literal physical death. So what's going on there? These people do not die. Is it the thing where now, now they have the on-off switch they had, had immortality, now eventually they're going to die? No, because the day you eat of it, you shall die. 
they were promised to be killed on the day that they ate it, which did not happen. So what's going on there? So <laughs> I, I ran through Genesis 3 with my boys and uh, they threw out, maybe God just lied to them. God just said, well, you know, um, I'm going to do this, but they had no intentions of doing that. He lied. That's one possibility. The text does not preclude that possibility. That's one thing. When we're reading the text, we don't discount possible readings because of the implications. Oh, no, that would turn God into a liar or anything like that. If it's a possibility, we should list it among the possibilities and discuss the merits. How about another possibility? God showed mercy. God had every intent to kill them, but decided not to. Maybe, maybe in the in the in the whole process of questioning them and figuring out what's going on there, God decided that there's mitigating factors and they're not worthy of death. Maybe the punishment didn't fit the crime in this case because they were kind of tricked or deceived into doing this, and so it wasn't quite their fault. Maybe God was taking a little bit of responsibility onto himself. You know, sometimes God does that when he He inter interjects uh, things into people's lives. Uh, sometimes he bears a little bit of responsibility. So maybe he's doing that. Maybe maybe he's seen himself as implicated in some way uh, the the woman who you gave me lord you know this is this is kind of your fault god maybe he's he's internalizing some of that maybe the idea is uh, now we're casting you out of the tree of life and you can't partake that in any way and, th and that's a fitting enough punishment it, it it kind of fits the idea that in the day you eat of it you will die so they're cast out of the garden in any case, in any case, I don't think that the spiritual death is is considered here by the author. I don't I don't see anything to think that that's a category, a category of thought uh, of this author. I think it's a physical death that had been threatened and had been mitigated in some fashion, in some way, and didn't quite happen as God had said it would. So the serpent turns out to be accidentally right in this way as well. So the serpent possibly could have been trying to get Adam and Eve killed, and that possibly could have played into the mitigation of the punishment of Adam and Eve eventually. That, you know, God's not just going to, you know, kill his creatures who have been tricked into doing something in order to get them killed. Possibly. Possibly what could be going on there. Then, then there occurs some sort of divine discussion. You have these divine discussions. It seems like a council discussion where... Shall we make man in our image? And no one objects. And then God makes man in his image, in the image of the angels, in the divine image. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. So there's a divine discussion that halfway through the quote apparently turns into narration. This was the ultimate decision from this conversation. And it's it's precautionary. God doesn't want man eating from this tree of life. And so he's taking active measures to pre prevent it, which is a very interesting concept in itself. Why does God, does, it, does God have like total surveillance over the whole earth at all times? So why are you taking precautionary methods? removing man from from vulnerable locations and then in in verse 24 he drove out the man and at the east of the garden of eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life so you have an active surveillance system you got an angel with a sword that is guarding the entrance in order to uh, have access to this tree of life and so god's very wary of man eating this you would think that there might be better ways to protect this tree, or you might think that uh, it might be unnecessary to have an active guard if if God is in the Calvinist system, micromanaging everything, controlling every single small detail. Why do you have to have active guards to to make sure that no one gets access to this tree of life? No one tries to sneak in and taste, and and even if they do. Does this thwart God? Does does them eating of it preclude God from killing them? Could that be the case? Is is that why God is fearful of this tree? Uh, so it's it's a strange turn of events that we eventually are led to here. This this whole uh, eating of the tree. 
Interestingly enough, there's an Epic of Gilgamesh uh, parallel to this. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh has to uh, go find this fruit of life, and the fruit of life is under the ocean because there's been a global flood. Possibly, this this global flood you know, pushes the tree underwater, and then the then the tree itself is guarded by a giant serpent, and the serpent eventually eats the fruit instead of Gilgamesh in the, in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So very similar legends going on between Genesis and the Epic of Gilgamesh. Could it be could it be the same tree? Could it be the same plant? Yeah. It, it it could be. It could be. It could be it could be both be be accurate. It could be the case that uh, after the flood of Noah in Genesis 6, the tree was sent down into the depths of the ocean. Anyway, there's a lot to think about, uh, a lot to talk about. Genesis 3 is a very interesting text. It doesn't quite fit the picture of God that a lot of people have in their mind. And so you kind of really got to read it closely to see what's going on there. It kind of uh, subverts our expectations. It it gives us a different glimpse onto God's interaction with mankind. It gives us a different glimpse. Just just thinking about Satan differently. If this, this animal is not Satan, how does that paint the rest of the Bible? How does that paint our theology of redemption? How does that paint our theology in the New Testament of uh, Christ's sacrifice? How does that uh, paint our picture of just Satanology or whatever? How, how, does, how does Satan interact with the Bible in that case? A lot of interesting things to think about. Any questions, comments, put that down in uh, the comments section. Start a thread on the God is Open Facebook group. Thank you for listening. <laughs>